Hey guys, welcome back to the Uncommodified Podcast and to another Uncork Conversation. Today, I would like to welcome my partner and my colleague, Amanda McDougall, to the show. Back to the show, actually. Amanda, how are you today? I'm great. How are you, Tim? I'm doing awesome. By the way, this is just like a regular day at the office for Amanda and I, but you know, it's uh, different because we're going to do a podcast together. So listen, thanks for joining me today. The last time that you and I connected on the podcast, Amanda, was back when we released an episode on the 1st of September, 2020. It was episode number eight at that time. So we're well beyond that. It was an episode entitled Red Wine in the Real World of Women Leaders. If you haven't listened to that episode where Amanda and I just talk about what leadership looks like from a female perspective perspective and her experience. And and interestingly enough, when we had that conversation, Amanda, when we had that, you were still full time in your in in your your leadership career for an organization and just beginning to really move into this world of consulting, training, coaching uh, on a on a a full time basis. And now you've crossed that Rubicon and now you're doing this full time. So what a great journey you've had since then. It's been a ride, that's for sure. It's been a ride. And it's been a ride because you're trying to do it with me, and that's a bit, that's a crazy ride. That's like a re- really crazy roller coaster because I don't do anything really traditionally because partly because I, I wasn't traditionally trained. And because of that, that that's, could be good on some days and bad on other days, but it does make it more difficult for somebody who's coming with a more trained background like yourself to somehow say, man, you, why do you do it that way? Because that doesn't seem right. No, no judgment, Tim. It's more like having that crazy tour guide on the tour bus. You get, it's much more entertaining. Uh, Great. Or that crazy (laughs) uncle at the Christmas party or whatever it is. Yeah. Maybe. I get it. I get it. Fair, fair enough. So listen, let's uh, let's kick this off as we do all on court conversation. It's uh, morning time. So I'm going to get into my coffee. You got a coffee? Yeah, I got a coffee. Awesome. So for all of our clients, we don't drink anything other than coffee during work hours. Well, it depends on the day, I have to admit. Okay, I'll just fess up. Every once in a while, you know, late in the day, it's a long day, might have a scotch, an early scotch every once in a while, Amanda. Yeah, or, you know, if it's a really bad day, I might add Irish cream to my coffee, Tim. A little bit of bit. A little bit of Bailey's concealed in the yeah. cup. Anyways, you're giving away our trade secrets. Not, <laughs> we have to probably not need to do that. So, so Amanda, here's the conversation I want to have with you, and it's really around a problem that I've encountered many, many times in my consulting career over the last 25, 30 years. And it's an experience that I've had and a challenge that I see for people in organizations. And so what I'm going to do today for, for uh, you, I just want to, give, I want to tell you a story and tell the listeners a bit of a story of an experience that I've had. And, and even my own brother had this experience. And, and that is that I'll use my brother as an example. He was, uh, he was a phenomenal, te- he is and was a phenomenal technician as it relates to the repairing of small engines. And so for his whole career, that's what he did. He actually uh, as well t- uh, teaches still a uh, small engine repair at a local community college, not far from where I live. And so just a master technician in relationship to, to uh, fixing equipment. And uh, he uh, worked for a large uh, retail company that sold uh, power equipment f- uh, for many, many years. And he was a lead technician, phenomenal at what he did. And at one point in his career, they came to him. And of course, the natural ascension sort of is you get really good at doing what you're doing. And eventually, they ask you to be the manager. And so at one point in his career, they came and asked him to be the manager of the whole service department for a, for a, ma- a larger region. And, you know, he said, yeah, let me, let's do it. And as he got into that experience, there began to be a subset of problems for him, things that he wasn't enjoying. And it became very difficult. All of a sudden, his responsibilities were changing. He was no longer doing regularly what he was really great at with his hands. Now he was involved in all sorts of meetings uh, with a lot of people from corporate. You know, I'm going to use it for those of you who can't see me. If you're in the video, you see it's air quote from corporate. And my brother that experience was difficult. And all of a sudden, his responsibilities were changing. His role was changing. Uh, what he needed to do for his people were cha- was changing. Uh, and he felt really unequipped for that and eventually got to a point where he just said, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I want my old job back. I don't like this thing. Uh, I didn't really may- know what I was signing up for, maybe. And again, he's a great person. He's very smart. Uh, but he doesn't do, you know, he doesn't do bullshit real well and, and, and just trying to manage all the tensions of dealing with people's 
bullshit, frankly, downstream and then trying to, to take what the corporation is asking and the mandates they're giving uh, and having to communicate them. And he really began to struggle and eventually said, I'd like my old job back. Now, he they're, graciously, I guess, they were in a position they were able to do that. So eventually he was able to slip back into his old role and, and that, that changed for him. But something was happening for him. And I've seen this many times in my own consulting career. I've seen it at companies that I work with as we begin to train and teach on leadership and management. People sometimes stick up their hand and say, oh, I don't think that's for me. And some people who were really already doing it, they had a title. They had a title called manager, but they were struggling. They were saying, well, if, if that's what managing leading people is all about, I don't want to do that. I just want to do my job what I'm good at because I'm an expert. I'm an expert at this, and that makes me feel really good. And so I've seen this weird thing that happens sometimes where people get, quote, promoted or whatever it is to another level, but all of a sudden something shifts underneath them, and it doesn't go well for them, and it doesn't sometimes go well for the organization. And so as a consultant to me today, I'm asking you this question, and we're going to let our listeners listen into it. So if you're listening and you're, you're either a person with an opportunity in front of you or you're, maybe you're a manager or leader in a company that's about to give somebody an opportunity, this is an, a good conversation, I think, for you to just uh, put your ear, your, your ear to, to and listen in as we have this conversation. So here's my question to you, Amanda. What, what was going on for my brother? And what's going on for the people that I'm, I'm telling you sometimes have a challenge with this, what's really happening? Well, I think what's really happening is people often get swept up in this ideal of becoming a manager and it being a promotion and being seen as, you know, the next logical step in your career, right? And and really, it's, it's not fundamentally at the bottom of it, it's a career change. It might be more money, uh, but in terms of really thinking about it, you're changing careers. Fundamentally, what you do every day when you go into the shop or into the office is is different. Your focus is different. And people often don't think about that. I mean, if you think about how our culture has been formed, um, you know, we started honestly as a monarchy system, right? All of us. Uh, and we had a religious hierarchy back in time, you know, Catholic Church. And we aspired to make the next logical step in the hierarchy because that meant more power, more control. And our businesses are still structured that way. Our organizational charts are still set that way. And so we aspire to move up the next step on the organizational chart because we think it's prestige. We think it's power. And we don't really stop to think about whether or not we want to do what's essentially a career change. So, so the fundamental problem from your perspective, and I, and I would agree with the supposition, is, is that, so of course it is a promotion. I mean, I, I, the, so my brother, if I use my brother as an example, he got a promotion. There's no doubt about that. And that came with, I'm sure it came maybe with some additional holidays. Maybe it came with some more, I'm sure it came with more money. But it also came with a subset of new responsibilities that apparently either he didn't listen very well, to be very frank, about what they were. Mm -hmm. uh, he, or he didn't understand that there was going to be a subset of new skills that he was going to require in this new journey. And he, either he wasn't prepared to learn them, he didn't realize he didn't need to learn them, or someone who was giving him this opportunity didn't appreciate that the skills that brought my brother to that point we're not going to necessarily take him forward. He had gone for formal training, for instance, to be a mechanic. So he, he right. took formal training and understood. And, and all the training he participated up until that time was, was training regarding product training. There was probably some customer service training there for him as a technician. But all of a sudden now, the skills that have brought him there, I guess, were not going to be the skills that were going to take him forward. And and so that really is an interesting thing. So yes, it is a promotion, but if we only see it that way, well, I think what you're starting to say is that's part of the fundamental problem, both for the person and the manager or the leader giving that opportunity. If you only see it as that, you might be missing a big piece of the puzzle. That's true. You, you know, I mean, I'm being a bit provocative in saying becoming a manager isn't a promotion. It's a career change. It's probably not as cut and dry as that. But let me just throw this out. So so what is a promotion? Right. So the dictionary definition 
you know, is the act of raising someone to a higher or more important position or rank, but, but more important to who, right? So another way of thinking about that is increase in authority, influence, and compensation, right? You get more money, you have more influence, you have more authority. But I would challenge that in some organizations, not all, but in some organizations is a frontline manager position representative of increase of influence and authority. Or is it actually just a change in, in that you're no longer responsible for your technical expertise, you're responsible for managing a group of people? When it comes right down to it, you know, we, we call supervisors managers, might even give the illusion that the managers have influence on hiring and firing. But when it comes down to it, they can't even blink without the approval of their boss right in terms of who they want to hire or if they want to fire someone so so really you know we make it seem like it's an increase in influence and authority but in actuality they're just shifting their focus of how they're spending their day because if you think about what a manager is right there's lots of definitions out there of what a manager is but maybe for the purposes of our discussion it's a position that has authority or influence over the people in an organization in terms of hiring firing performance management and directing their work right so i'm not talking about project managers or you know um, maybe a technical specialist that coaches other colleagues in their area of expertise right i'm talking about so if we're talking specifically about granting those those authorities to a position, then yeah, maybe you could look at it as a promotion. But in many cases, organizations call positions managers, but maybe they're not actually managers. Maybe they're just moving to managing people rather than managing work, right? So hmm. it's, it's a nuance there, Tim. Interesting yep. talent, but um, really people need to understand what they're getting into when they're asked if they want to be a manager. Right, and so I guess this is that this is that tension between is it just a you know is it just a you know a really fantastic promotion or mm -hmm. is it a fundamental career change and again um, not as cut and dry as that but if I don't see it as cut and dry in that maybe there's a sticky point inside this that my brother experienced and others that I know because I've I've seen this many many times over my consulting and training career where people have not fundamentally understood either when they received this opportunity or somebody who gave it what was really going to shift underneath this and and I think that's what I want to explore today because at the end of the day if we're going to if people are going to uncommodify that experience and and do it better and different around this they got to think about some things and that's really what I want to tuck into today so I know you reached out recently uh, and used that wonderful networking uh, opportunity called LinkedIn I know you reached out to link to LinkedIn in general and and did a bit of uh, research on this what did your research suggest to you how do people in general in the LinkedIn community see this conversation well, it was interesting. I did post it as a black and white response. Is becoming a manager a promotion or is it a career change? And 94% of the people who responded to that uh, survey um, said that it was not a promotion. It was a career change. Wow. Now, there were some comments, you know, and some discussion around is it both, right, in, in that post. But that's a pretty overwhelming response. Uh, to to only have six percent say it's it's purely a promotion. Um, now it'd be interesting to know and uncover what positions those people held, right? Right. Chances are there's a bit of a bias in terms of those who I'm connected to and my networking within LinkedIn are primarily in management roles. Right. So maybe those who are in management roles are like, holy smokes, yep, it's a career change, and so right. that's why ninety four percent said that, right? But it yeah. is telling. It is. It is. So if we work on that as a basic supposition, so we'll, we'll use this as our starting point. So if it is not just a promotion, it, if it is a fundamental career change. Yeah. So let's talk about that again for the person receiving the opportunity and the person giving it. Um, so here's let's let's think of it this way. So what's happen what what what's happening and what happens if an organization and organizations don't exist. So the the leaders that are doing this, if they don't think that becoming a manager is a career change. What what's the what's the impact of that? What happens if if they don't consider that as a strong possibility? Hmm. Well, that's a really good question. You know, and at a high level, 
um, at an organizational level, there's something called the Peter Principle. And um, if you've gone and done any business school training, or if anyone's you know listening to the podcast who's in HR, they're probably familiar with it. But the general majority of people haven't really heard of the Peter Principle, but maybe in their gut know it to be true. So basically, the Peter Principle is an observation that organizations tend to promote employees to the point of their incompetence. So you do a good job, and so you're handpicked to move up the organizational chain. If you do a good job in that level, then you're picked to go up another level. But if you do a really bad job at any of those levels, that's where you're going to stop, right? You're going to stop being promoted up through the organization, and you'll be a mediocre employee, you know, just because you're, you've been promoted to the point of your incompetence. And um, really, the Peter Principle was developed by a sociologist and a scholar, actually a Canadian, which is interesting. Um, and, and Dr. Peter laid this out way back in the 60s. Like this is, some, and it's still something we see today. Um, and there's been studies as recently as 2018 that says, yep, yeah, this still continues to happen. And, you know, you can look in a sales, a lot of sales organizations, this happens, mm -hmm. right? You take a really excellent salesperson, they do a great job. And so because they have such great stats, they're tagged to become the next manager. And because the skill sets can be so different to be successful as a salesperson versus being a manager, often they, they fail. And if you don't think about um, equipping that person for the new skill sets, um, then that's gonna be very costly to the organization. So what Peter proposed was that you really need to give the same attention to skills training for employees that are moving into management positions as you do for any technical expectations for an individual contributor in a company. Hmm. You know, it's, and, and, you know, as you say that, and it's interesting you use sales as an example, because I've seen this, I've done a lot of work consulting and training with sales uh, professionals and sales leaders over the years. And absolutely, you can see this happen because I've seen, you see this where this transition happens. And what happens in that case is the salesperson uh, as it becomes leader they get deceived because they believe now their customer has to buy from them. So when they were a salesperson, right, they, they knew the customer didn't have to buy the product they were selling. So they, they, they took a certain approach. They understood the customer, the customer's personality style. They, they flexed their style to them. They, they, they understood the obstacles and, and ob objections of the customer. They overcame them. They constructed a, a, they served the customer, constructed an argument, a value propositional argument to convince that customer that buying from them was a good idea. They cross over and now become manager and they just expect everybody to do what they tell them to do. Ah. They, they forget. They forget that they're they're now they're uh, they're still selling something. They're a customer, but they're no longer selling to a cut. But they're they're selling you know a product. They're selling maybe strategies, behaviors, actions, attitudes. But they deceive themselves to believe that because they're they're selling that to their employees that they have to buy. Yeah. You know, and they we even use that term when employees don't get on board an organization. We say they didn't buy in. Well, that's a transaction term, right? But you see that happening where all of a sudden they don't realize that actually some of the same skills have to be applied in the same way. But now they also have to learn the art of managing and leading and motivating and, and, and doing this with humans and, you know, and not just process. Because once you put process in place, it doesn't move. But humans move. They come in happy and sad and motivated and unmotivated. And, and wow, it's all of a sudden. And I've seen that go to hell in a handbasket awful quickly. We're six months into it. That sales leader is saying, give me my old job back. Because, uh, and again, they, but they didn't think of retraining or reskilling. And nor did the leaders that chose them. So, you know, it's a really powerful idea. And again, if you're listening today, I want you to think about this. If you have been given an opportunity to become a manager or a leader at a higher level in your organization, whether it's a community organization or, or a business organization, a social organization, and you haven't acquired the skills, gone back to school and acquired the real skills that are required to lead people, you need to, you need to press pause and do that. If you're a leader who's hiring people, you need to ask yourself, 
what skills, what people skills do I need to make sure this person possesses? Just like if you were taking them to a new technical job. It's a really great point, Amanda, because I have seen the impact of this. So let me ask you, wh- why is it, do you think that, that organizations and people just don't think about it this way? Why, why is it that they don't consider this? Well, I think sometimes, you know, it's a lot of work. Like yeah. you think about it, you think about it in terms of, oh, I have to make a job description. What do I need a job description for? Right? Like, and, and so, but the reality is the, the process of creating a job description forces you to articulate what it takes for that position to be successful. Right. But there's lots of companies out there, especially smaller um, to medium sized organizations that don't have formalized job descriptions. Right. Because it's too much work. It's too tedious. Right. But but without understanding that underlying thought process that has to go into it. And if you can't articulate what it takes for that position to be successful, then how can you ever communicate? Like, how can that person ever be successful? Right. So so there's that. I also think that a lot of times like companies, people, they don't value soft skills, Hmm. right? So they, they're, there's no recognition of the significance of shifting because everybody can do that. You know, everybody can be a comms person until the the issue hits the fan. And all of a sudden you see what, what a, what a communication specialist skills are, right? The same thing. Everybody, everybody thinks you can manage people, right? Until you get into that role and then realize, oh, there's, you know, so there's that recognition or non-recognition that the soft skills are just as important as the technical skills. And then I think the other reason is people get caught up just in that cultural value of moving up the hierarchy, right? Mm. Like that says I'm successful. And why wouldn't Joe want a promotion? Because it's going to look better on his resume, right? Or why wouldn't I say yes to that promotion, right? That's going to look better for me without really thinking about what it might mean. Hmm. Yeah, they. Yeah, the skills that need to be require uh, to acquired and are required is a big part of that discussion. It, it's interesting you say that because I, I recently saw a clip from an old interview with Warren Buffett, uh, and Warren Buffett was being asked a question. Uh, obviously, he didn't hear the question so much just his answer, but obviously being asked a question about what are some of the most important, you know, sort of skills and traits that you need to think about. He made a very interesting comment. He said, you know, I have students come to me all the time in the programs that I'm involved in and everything, and these guys, you know, these students are high-level business achievers. You know, they're taking doctoral, you know, uh, you know writing doctoral thesis on business and, and MBA, can, and all this kind of stuff, right? And he said, the thing I say to them is, is that the one skill you need to acquire that will make you 50% more valuable instantly is to become a better communicator. Mm. It's a brilliant clip. He said, look, this is what I tell people. If you become a better communicator in writing and orally, you will be 50% more valuable <laughs> instantly to your organization and to the people around you. Now, so think about that. Again, that's a soft skill. It's not a, you know, it's soft, it's hard in some ways, but it's a soft skill really that you have to learn. And so again, we, we think about that, that person is a technician uh, they're very tactical. They're very, they're, they understand that job function coming out of it. But now if they just became a better communicator, they'd be 50% more effective. So do we actually take them to communication school first? Do they, do we teach them? And my suggestion, my experience is, is and I'm sure yours as well is typically we take people back to school for soft skills when there's a problem. Ah, uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then we expect that one course is going to fix the problem as well, right? Right, correct. Where, correct. where you go to school for a full degree to become, you know, an engineer or a nurse or a, right, like all of these different things. But yeah, one communications course for a full day or maybe two, if you're lucky, is going to all of a sudden make you a, a, a fabulous professional communicator. Yep. <laughs> Hundred percent, hundred percent. So when you look at this and you get inside of it, what's the real cost to the people in the organization if 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 this is not managed well, this transition, this quote promotion, but more more appropriately maybe a, this career change that we're talking about, um, what what's the cost and what happens if this doesn't work well? Hmm. Well, you know, if you're able to cost how much or how expensive it is to do a full recruitment effort. Um, you know, any organization can put together that those costs of what it costs to post for the job, the time for the interviews. And so if someone's not successful in any role, there's an inherent cost to that, right? There's loss in productivity as you ramp up yet another new person, all of those, those hard costs, um, are, are sitting there, uh, for not only that person, 
but for the whole department or organizational group that that person is responsible for. Um, you know, I'm sure that there are some listening to this podcast who can empathize going through three managers in three years or three managers in five years. And every time a new manager comes in, there's different expectations and productivity levels drop. And you're not a high performing team if you're consistently having a different person who's coordinating you, right? So, so there's that productivity cost and then the cost of the hiring. There's also the employee morale, morale component to that um, in terms of uh, just having a team that understands each other, works well together. And so you've got that piece and, and the underlying stress and frustration that, that sits under that. Right. So I know a lot of organizations inherently understand having good employee engagement. Right. And, and, you know, but maybe don't stop to think about one one challenging hire, one bad fit manager doesn't just affect that position. It affects all the people under it. So if that person, you know, is responsible for 12 people, you've impacted 12 people. If that person's responsible for 50 people, you've impacted 50 people. So yeah. there is a broad there is a broad impact that I suspect is far more expensive than just investing in some in some management training up front if that person's never received it. Hmm, it's, a, it's a good point. You know, the, as you talk about that, I think maybe the other part that I would say that I've seen as a bit of a cost of this is that when you take a technical expert in a department, a uh, frontline technical expert, and you promote them to become the, the supervisor, then the manager of that department, if they haven't shed their begun to shed their identity, because I think part of this is an identity thing. If they haven't started to shed their identity and, and now taken on the identity of a manager leader and their identity still is in technical expert, the, the other inherent challenge that I've seen in that is, is that probably twofold. One, they tend to continually insert themselves downstream because they are the expert. And so that their identity is in that expertise. And when push comes to shove, when they're struggling with the human part of management, it's easier to go back and do what they did technically to make themselves feel good, frankly. Yeah. That, so that's number one. The second piece is, is that if they're not careful um, and they haven't shed that identity, they struggle with, with uh, raising up and training people and even hiring people who might have greater, quote, expertise than they had in that role, because if their identity hasn't shifted, then that gets sort of muddy for them. So there's, a, there's, a, there's another piece, I think, inside this that if people don't start making that shift in identity is they look back to that old job to find their sense of self, to find their sense of significance, to find their sense of contribution. Because in a lot of ways, frankly, particularly if you're a technical expert with, with machinery or process, once you set it in place, it doesn't change. Now you got to be an expert with people. And like I said earlier, they're all over the place. And so it's easier some days just to reach back into your old job and get satisfaction. And I think that's another potential cost yeah. if you haven't fully understood the impact and trained a person to find their identity and satisfaction in a, in a subset of new uh, ob objectives and outcomes that they're trying to achieve. Well, yes, and you've raised a really good point on the individual level, right? Everything that I mentioned was on an organizational cost level. But if you think about it, you've got an excellent person who's thriving in a position, and then because they've been moved into a people management role, they're no longer thriving. The cost to that person hmm. is potentially their career within that organization. Because rarely do organizations have a good plan to help move people back into a, a position that maybe they were a better fit for. Right. Mm -hmm. So unless, you know, unless you really think about that person's not thriving, they're in management, what usually happens. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and then a perfectly good career in a company could be done because the transition wasn't handled well. But uh, you raise a really good point on that personal identity. And where does a person get their identity from? Mm -hmm. And that, I guess goes back to, again, if I just if I'm selling just a promotion, not a career change, if I'm not selling an identity shift. Uh, if I'm not under, if, if I'm, if I, if I'm the leader inviting people in this opportunity, but I am not doing that, then obviously at the end of the day, I might be doing them a disservice as, as well. So I mean, there's an interesting, this is a fairly interesting conversation. Again, if you're listening, 
don't get lost in the well no it's a promotion you guys are missing no don't get lost in that okay it's not it is a promotion but it's not just a promotion maybe and but more importantly if you if you don't see it as a career change then you're going to approach it in a certain way that may or may not be helpful and healthy both for the individual receiving the opportunity and for the organization and the manager or leader giving the opportunity that's where the tension lies. And I, I love this conversation, Amanda, because you brought this conversation to my attention proactively a couple of weeks ago. And I hadn't thought about it for a long time. But when you started asking me some questions about it, and, and I remembered these cer certain circumstances in my own career and l working with people. And I realized, man, this is a really important discussion, not only for my present customers, your present customers, our customers and, and partners together, but also to the people listening in. Because again, you might be receiving an opportunity or giving one, and this is something for you to consider. Because if you're going to do it well, if you're going to uncommodify the experience and do it amazingly well, uniquely well, there's some things we need to think about. So that being said, let's get this, let's make this really practical, Amanda. So if, I, if I'm becoming uh, a management professional, okay, if I'm, if I'm the one receiving this opportunity, can you give me certain things that I ought to consider on a list that I might want to check off and just sort of say, hey, Tim, these are things you need to think about. Like, can we get that practical for a second? Help me if this was me. Yeah. So I guess the first question, Tim, is do you love working with people? Uh, because maybe you, you go to your job right now and you just go to your machine and you get your job done, or you just go to your computer and you work on your files. Um, so do you really love people working with people, helping people that that would be the first thing I'd ask you. Right. Um, and not just like the answer that you think everyone should say, right? Like at the end of the day, really honestly ask yourself that question. Um, the other thing I, I would ask you is, are you drawn to thinking more broadly than about your own work? Like when you're sitting there and you're daydreaming about things, do you tend to only focus on what, what you have accountability for? Or do you tend to be drawn to thinking about how it fits in the big picture? Sort of that strategy word, right? Because mm. as a manager, you're always taking the corporate strategy and figuring out how to help your team, you know, meet those objectives. Um, I would also say in alignment with what you were saying about personal identity, you know, are you ready to set aside technical details in your day to day work? Are you ready to allow that part of who you've been to to uh, take a back seat? Maybe isn't going to disappear totally from your day to day, but to take a back seat in mm. your day to day work. And we've also already talked about the importance of good communication skills. Is that something that you think you have, honestly, when you think about it? And um, is monitoring and measuring and tracking fun to you? And I say that sort of with a bit of a smile on my face, right? But when you become a manager, a lot of what you're doing is measuring, monitoring, tracking, reporting. Um, either You're either reading reports on how things are going or you're putting information into reports on how things are going. And so if that just makes you go, oh, then maybe you don't want to be a manager, right? So that's something to really think about. Um, and then there's a few things like, do people come to you? Like, like, what have you noticed about yourself? Like, do people naturally come to you for advice? Do they naturally seek out sort of um, your opinions on things? Or have you noticed that? Because that might be an indicator that you could be a, a natural leader. Not to say that you can't learn a lot of those leadership skills, but you might already have some, some innate skills there that people are, are coming to you about. And um, here's, I think, one of the biggest ones tied to the identity question, Tim. Are you actually ready to shift from being one of the gang to setting the example. Hmm. Um, there's a big shift uh, in the coffee room, for example, when you move to be a manager. You know, it's an interesting feeling, speaking from personal experience, about being in a position where you can go into the coffee room and everyone just adds you into the chatter. And then being a manager and realizing when you walk into the room, all the chatter stops. <laughs> And, and really thinking about what the implications are in terms of, of being representative of, of the corporate 
you know, messaging and communications and stuff like that. And for some people, that is a real barrier to wanting to become a manager. Yeah. Um, well, and, and as you talk about that, that really probably was the major thing for my brother. When I think back to that original story or question I had when we started, that that um, representation of the of, of corporate for my brother was very difficult. Often, frankly, he, you know, again, not to, to be disrespectful of his corporate environment, but he did not feel that the corporate strategies fit, frankly, the everyday real life that he had, he and his people lived in. And he wasn't the kind of guy who would just go out and say what he didn't believe or support that and they weren't able to make a compelling argument to him at times that that made sense and that became a real sticking block for him there's no doubt in his relationships and so I guess I could take that sort of check that personal checklist that you just gave and I could turn it into an organizational checklist on the other side if I was if I was a leader or giving an opportunity all of the things you just mentioned would apply on the opposite side I, I, I would need to make sure that I'm as a opportunity provider inviting somebody into a management role i ought to be considering the same types of things in my list and i and i guess the other piece would be is okay the person may not have all those things yeah. but they may have a desire and then we need a strategy to to train and equip and make that happen so what should the or organization you know the person on the organization side what should they really consider Again, other than philosophically maybe changing this proposition, it's not just a promotion. It really is a career change. What, mm. what else would your advice be to somebody on the organizational side be in this process? Right. So we've talked about how, you know, even the organizational side are people, right? They're individuals who are thinking. Right. And so as the individual who's thinking about recruiting or hiring, being really honest with yourself about what the requirements are for that position you're trying to fill hmm. right and and really honest with yourself about the people you're looking at to fill that position like are they people leaders or are they workflow managers or are they good technically like what stop and pause and really think about whether or not those people have the skill sets that are needed for that position um, and then I would say you need to approach people management training just like you would any other technical training requirements so if that's something that is not traditionally been important for you to really stop and ask yourself why, what, what's the underlying reason why, why that is the case. And then I think ensuring transparent support for any of those employees that are considering management, right? Clarifying for them about the shifts that are required to move into management and putting in place supports to help with that, including perhaps an off ramp if it ends up not being a good fit. I mean, mm. I have been, I was in an organization once that did an excellent job at allowing um, technical specialists to, to test out being a manager. Mm. So they would actually be an acting assignment for six months to actually live it for six months and see, is this really what you want? And then if they chose to go back to their previous job, no harm, no foul, right? Like it, it wasn't a failure then. Um, so really thinking about like an exit strategy, if that's not going to work, that, that isn't signaling a total and complete failure for this really great employee. Cause that's why you're looking at them for a promotion, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and it's a good point. And I, I can think of several, uh, experiences, even in one organization where I think they did that brilliantly. They were bringing their leaders into a new world of training their leaders and managers to, to lead their people, to be better people leaders, as well as process and strategy. But there was a big people leadership initiative for, for training and development with their key leaders. And there were several leaders through that process who began to recognize that this people leadership thing was just not for them. And uh, and they did a great job of offboarding them. Uh, I like I like the term you use. Gave them an off ramp. So and they uh, fell back into their more technical roles they came from. And and that was a great opportunity because they were great people. And I think that's the other thing I would want to just make sure we're focusing on when people don't succeed. Either if if great if, if managers invite if leaders and managers invite somebody across the river to the management side or somebody accepts that opportunity, if it doesn't go well, it doesn't mean they're not, they're bad people. They're still great people on both sides of the equation. Great people trying to do a great job, trying to offer opportunity for development, you know, wanting to develop. These are all great things. 
But the, the essence of this conversation reminds me that if we're not careful, that what we end up doing is we end up saying at the end, well, not only did it fail, but you failed. You know, right. you failed, Mr. Senior Manager, because you put the wrong guy in the wrong place or the wrong lady in the wrong place. And you failed, you know, Mr. Supervisor Technician, because you thought you wanted to be a leader, but you, but you can't do it. It's not a, pe a people failure. It's it's a it's a process failure in some ways, because if the process was was designed better to help people across that river and get there well and succeed, then everybody would do better in the end. And I think mm -hmm. that's an important reminder because because some people are probably stuck in this right now, Amanda. And that so listen, as we finish up today, here's a question. So I, I want you to speak to two different audiences. I want you to first speak to maybe a senior level leader who is who is either thinking of of cross of, of inviting somebody across that river today, or maybe has has and it hasn't gone so well. What what advice would you give them? And secondly, if somebody has an opportunity in front of them, if they've been invited recently to cross that river and come over to the management side, what would you want to say to them as we finish up? And speak to those two groups separately, if if you if you would. Hmm. All right. Well, I think if if you're a senior leader and you are looking at inviting someone across the river, it's very similar to what we said around organizations. You really need to remember what it is about that person that is sticking out to you about why you want to invite them across the river and do an honest thought process around if it aligns with what you need in a manager. And then do some really honest thinking about how you help set that person up for success. Hmm. because they're a good person and that's why you're looking at them. And if you're a senior leader and you've got someone in a management position that's not thriving, remind yourself what it was about that person to begin with that you thought was great. And remind yourself that this was a great person and how are you going to help them be successful again? And it might not be staying in the same position they're in. You know, it may be helping them get back to the career where they thrived. Hmm. Um, or it may be that they just need more training and skill development to be successful in the new career that you've moved them into in your in your company. Hmm. I would say if if you are a new manager, maybe maybe or you're thinking about becoming a manager, uh, go back to that checklist, right, that we talked about. Um, really ask yourself honestly those questions. Make sure you're not deluding yourself in the thought of power control moving up the hierarchy and really think about the work because as speaking as someone who moved across that chasm, um, that increase in authority or perceived authority and salary really is only shiny and new for the first six months. <laughs> and then after that, if it's not a good fit, you start asking yourself, why am I doing all this for an extra five grand a year? Right. Like, and that's a really telling statement to yourself. It means you don't like the work you're doing. Right. It means that you think somehow that the work you're doing is far more important than the small incremental raise potentially. Right. Um, or extra weeks vacation and really ask yourself before you jump in, am I going to like this job in a year and a half when, you know, I've got a new standard of living and it's not a big promotion anymore. And to your point, Tim, being a manager doesn't mean you get to boss people around all day and they'll all listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, no, that that is true. That is true because, I, you know, I thought that that's the way it was going to be when I got married and I found it very quickly. That is not the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I've taken that lesson into my career for sure. And listen, I want to add to that. By the way, man, man I think that's really brilliant and careful advice. The one thing I would also want to add to that is one of the most difficult positions, I think, in a lot of organizations is what we would call middle management. When you think of it, it yeah. they get sandwiched between, right? And oftentimes when people are invited out of that technical role to that first management role, it's really middle management. And the challenge there is when they get promoted, the peop their, their, their colleagues that they came from, Right. They believe they've been given a lot of power and authority when they've act, and they think it's like, you know, it's 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 huge and it's actually very little. And that creates a subset of problems downstream for them and their and their and their friends, the group of friends they came from. And second of all, 
they also get stuck because they don't have the same authority they think they were going to get sometimes. In, and you talked about that earlier. And that becomes really a, a challenge, particularly as you talked about, you know, just that identity of being part of the gang. And one of the challenges is a lot of people believe, everyone around them has believed that they, when they got their promotion, they also got authority to do everything they ever wanted to change and they didn't like. And that's not true. And that, that goes back to that, are you part of that gang thing? That's a great question. Because when you get, get across to the other side, the things you thought were simple or easy to change are now, aren't always as simple as easy. And secondly, you have a certain finite budget to do some things. You can't do everything at once. And so now you're picking and choosing. And now you're picking and choosing out of a, 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 out of a, a call of things that your colleagues in the past wanted to have done. And that's a tense position. So again, it's a great thing to grow and develop in an organization. But at the same time, if we, either those who are invited into that development or those giving that opportunity don't understand sometimes what they're doing, they can create a subset of problems that they don't want to. And that's really what this whole conversation has been about today. You know, again, is, a, is it just a promotion or a really fabulous, fantastic promotion, or is it a fundamental career change to be asked to move from technician, supervisor to, quote, manager? That's for you to determine. And if you chose to listen in today, our encouragement for you is to think about that. Again, you could be in a, a for-profit business. You could be in a not-for-profit business. You could be in a community group that isn't even a business structure, but just it has leaders and different things. So think about what's happening in your organization and around you. And as you do, as you uncork this conversation in your life, do us a favor. Email me at tim at theuncommodified.com or connect with Amanda and I on social media and let us know how this conversation is resonating with you, what you're doing with it. And again, ask yourself the first question. Do you think it's just a promotion or is it a fundamental career change to be asked to cross the river from technician to supervisor? We have a certain proposition for you to think about today and we want you to think about it after the fact. Amanda, what I'm going to get you to do, by the way, is I'm going to get you to send over to me, um, maybe just flush out those checklists a little bit, a little bit more. I asked you for a checklist on the fly. Flush that out a little bit and we'll put some of that stuff in the show notes so that people who are wanting to explore this idea a little bit more on either side of this conversation could explore it a little bit more. Would you do that for us, Amanda? Yeah, for sure. I'd love to do that. That'd be awesome. Listen, Amanda, thanks for your time today. And thanks, guys, for listening in. We appreciate your time. Have an excellent day.